Welcome to UO Today. I'm Paul Peppis, Director of the Oregon Humanities Center. My guest today is Justin Driver, the Harry N. Wyatt Professor of Law at the University of Chicago Law School. Prior to his academic career, Driver clerked with Supreme Court Justices Stephen Breyer and Sandra Day O'Connor. A recipient of the American Society for Legal History's William Nelson Cromwell Article Prize, Driver has a distinguished publication record in the nation's leading law reviews. He has also written extensively for lay audiences, including pieces in Slate, The Atlantic, The Washington Post, and The New Republic, where he was a contributing editor. Driver teaches and writes in the area of constitutional law. His first book, The Schoolhouse Gate, Public Education, The Supreme Court, and The Battle for the American Mind, was published in September 2018. Driver gave a lecture titled, Are Public Schools Becoming Constitution-Free Zones? on April 8, 2019, as part of this year's African American Workshop and Lecture Series. Thanks so much for coming on the show. Glad to be with you. Thanks for having me. So tell us a bit about your background and what inspired you to pursue law as a career. Yeah, so I grew up in Washington, D.C. Um, I grew up in southeast Washington, which is a predominantly black neighborhood east of the Anacostia River. And starting at a very young age, I traveled to way upper northwest Washington, the most privileged segment of Washington, D.C. And in many ways, this book that I've just written grows out of those early experiences in the sense that I started thinking about why I was undergoing this long journey that required me to be on a bus and two different subway lines and then a fairly long walk. And I was thinking, why in the world am I doing this? Uh, and also, what opportunities am I gaining educationally as a result of that? And then also, what opportunities are my neighborhood playmates not gaining uh, as a result of going to the local schools? And so these early questions about education and equity and opportunity have been uh, you know, a big part of my life since at least I was 10 years old. And you, before you came to the academy, you, you obviously were clerking for Supreme Court justices, you practiced law. What made you decide that you wanted to come to the academy when yeah, you become yeah. a professor of law? Yeah. Um, you know, when I graduated from college, I thought I was going to be a public school teacher, and mm -hmm. I got certified to teach public school. And um, I applied for a fancy scholarship to go to England. I desperately wanted to be a Rhodes Scholar. And when I applied to be that, um, I also was encouraged to apply for the Marshall Scholarship. That's not so bad to be a Marshall. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so I, I, I did not even get an interview for the Rhodes. I ended up winning the Marshall Scholarship. And so that took me to England, and I started studying uh, school financing decisions. Um, mm -hmm. There's an important case called San Antonio Independent School District versus Rodriguez. And I was trying to understand that, and I thought, boy, maybe it would be helpful to look at uh, going to law school and trying to learn some of this constitutional doctrine because I found it very confusing and sort of almost invented out of thin air. I went to law school and learned that it was confusing <laughs> and not exactly invented out of thin air, but not that uh, different from that. And so that launched me on into a career of uh, thinking about the law and teaching and writing, and it's been a really wonderful career for me. I'm glad that I do this. So you, you mentioned you know, you're, you're traveling all this great distance to go to high school, and you, you have all these, this time to think about these issues that you're encountering every day. So you've, you have written this amazing book. Now, first of all, why don't you tell us about the, the uh, title of the book? Where's the title? Sure, from? yeah, the title is The Schoolhouse Gate, and that comes from a Supreme Court opinion called Tinker versus Des Moines Independent School District. And there, uh, th there are students in Des Moines who want to wear black armbands in protest of the Vietnam War. School officials get wind of it and say, oh no, that's too hot button of a topic. And it's an open question, do students have free speech rights? And so Justice Fortas's opinion for the court in Tinker gives me my title. He says, it can hardly be argued that students shed their constitutional rights at the schoolhouse gate. And I thought that was an incredibly evocative way of putting it. And uh, it's true that the Supreme Court has articulated a whole host of constitutional rights uh, that exist within the school that are different than when minors are in the public park across the street after school. And so I really wanted to take seriously 
this idea of the public school as a site of constitutional interpretation. So in the book, you, you make the very strong argument that, I, that uh, I'm quoting you, the public school has served as the most significant site for constitutional interpretation in the nation's history. That's a big claim. It is a big claim. <laughs> so it is a big claim. Tell us why that's true. There are some people who say that that claim is uh, so big that it's a product <laughs> of my university where I am now, the University of Chicago. Someone said, you guys at the University of Chicago You'd rather be bold and wrong than nuanced and correct. Uh, I think that I am both bold and correct, correct. and let me tell you why. <laughs> um, so uh, I suggest that the cases arising from the school have an unusual capacity for getting people's blood boiling. That's people in American society, but also the Supreme Court justices themselves. It's an area of sort of deep contestation. Uh, the second reason that makes me say that is that there are 50 million uh, students in public schools today. There are uh, several million teachers in schools, and so that means that on any given day, about one-sixth of the American population is in the public school. And this means that the first sustained exposure that most uh, people have to the government is in the form of the public school. And then the last thing that makes me talk about the significance uh, is that the disputes that exist in schools often mirror larger anxieties that have shaped American society going back to the 1920s and debates about immigration. Of course, mm -hmm. we're no stranger to thinking about uh, debates over immigration today. Mm -hmm. uh, racial equality in the 1950s, sex equality in the 1970s. So there's just a real trajectory here. And it also, it doesn't hurt that uh, I have the case of Brown versus Board of Education in my field, which right. is, many people would say, the most significant uh, constitutional decision of the 20th century, if not the Supreme Court's entire history. So you you raise Brown versus Board of Education, and you know one of the things that's interesting in the book is you 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 have a quite nuanced and interesting take on that decision. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yeah, that? Yeah, thanks for saying that. Brown is the case that I knew the most about going in, and one of the challenges of the book was to say something new about this case that is uh, pretty familiar and well known. But I did want to offer something of a revisionist account of Brown versus Board of Education. And so I try to do a, a couple of different things. Um, one is to cast doubt on the cult of unanimity around Brown versus Board of Education. Chief Justice Warren famously went to the Supreme Court as a new appointee and brought around his fellow justices to have a unanimous decision. This is hailed as being a wonderful thing, and um, people say it's uh, difficult to imagine the decision being as effective as it were, as it was, if, um, if there weren't unanimity. And that strikes me as wrong-headed. Um, it's worth contemplating whether there were costs associated with mm -hmm. unanimity. The last holdout was Justice Stanley Reed of Kentucky. And one could quite plausibly imagine uh, Chief Justice Warren writing a more robust opinion uh, had he not needed to keep Stanley Reed on board. I think it's uh, false to suggest that unanimity meant that everybody just rolled over. And that leads me to the second point, which is that uh, even though there was no dissenting opinion, uh, the South resisted Brown versus Board of Education with plenty of ferocity. Mm -hmm. um, so this idea that um, it bought acceptance as a result of unanimity, people were capable of forming their own opinions about Supreme Court opinions, uh, even in the absence of a dissenting opinion. So I'm uh, skeptical that uh, a dissenting opinion would have made the South resist the opinion with any greater ferocity. And you, your contention is that if, if uh, he wasn't trying to get unanimity, the, the actual judgment could have been more rigorous and might have staved off unanticipated problems that we've encountered because of the way that the, the, the decision was written. Exactly so. There's a real gap between the constitutional right that's recognized and then the remedy that's pursued. I do offer something of a heavily qualified defense of Brown versus Board of Education too, which is famous for the all deliberate speed mm -hmm. uh, component mm -hmm. in the sense that I say that Chief Justice Warren was deeply uncertain whether President Eisenhower would have supported an aggressive decision mm -hmm. in Brown. My real trouble with the Warren Court is not so much with Brown too, but the failure to get involved in a meaningful way from 1955 to 1969, there were 
important moments, not only with respect to Eisenhower, but of course the Kennedy administration and the Johnson administration, where there was every reason to believe that they were committed to the cause of racial equality in the courts silence in this area is deafening, and that's the real problem, rather than laying all of the blame at the feet of Brown too, in my estimation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, you mentioned um, th th there was this idea that if there was unanimity, that would make this bitter pill go down better, but in fact, there was tremendous resistance. One of the things that you talk about is, there is, I think, a perception that the court reflects public opinion. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that you've questioned is that claim. So tell us a little bit about yeah, that. Yeah, these days, many constitutional law professors suggest that the Supreme Court is a frail institution, that it is marching in lockstep with the views of the American people. And they go further and suggest when the Supreme Court attempts to defend minority rights, it ends up being powerless to do so and maybe hurting the very cause that they seek to help. Um, those are important scholars who have made that claim, but I am resistant to it. And one of the things I try to do in the book is to identify instances where the Supreme Court has successfully defended minority rights. Um, let me give you uh, a couple of examples yes, to put some sure. flesh on the bones. One would be the Barnett decision from 1943 where uh, students were required to pledge allegiance to the American flag upon penalty of expulsion. That raises real issues for Jehovah's Witnesses who believe that reciting the pledge violates their religious faith. Uh, Justice Jackson wrote a, a, a magnificent opinion for the court where he invalidated the measure and he said, if there is one fixed star in our constitutional constellation, it is that no official high or petty can prescribe which shall be orthodox. And this opinion comes down in 1943 at the height of World War II. Patriotic sentiment was running incredibly high. Schools in all 48 states are throwing out, expelling Jehovah's Witnesses and a, a group that uh, was not especially popular then. And so this is a magnificent instance of the Supreme Court uh, coming to the defense of a uh, marginalized group of citizens in order to defend their constitutional rights. One other quick example would be the Plyler versus Doe decision from 1982 where Texas had a statute that made it permissible to exclude unauthorized immigrants from Texas's schools. Texas was the only state in the nation that had this sort of law. Supreme Court of the United States invalidated the measure. Some of my fellow colleagues have said, eh, this decision isn't so important. Texas was the only state in the nation that had it, and therefore it's just an outlier. Just because Texas, in my view, was the first state in the nation that had this law does not mean that it would have been the last. Mm -hmm. And uh, we know very well today that anxieties about unauthorized immigration are far from confined to the nation's border. So this is an instance where the Supreme Court did rise up to defend uh, minority rights and has allowed millions of children to receive an education who otherwise would have been denied one. Mm -hmm. you, you're, you've raised the, the, uh, the thorny problem of immigration now. And this is one I know that because it's um, st really still a hot button issue and one that given the recent sh shifts on the court, it's quite conceivable. It, it's not with beyond the realm of possibility that the case that you've just described could be overturned, right? Or I do believe that that is a very real danger. When the current Chief Justice, John Roberts, was a young attorney working in the Reagan administration, he co-authored a memorandum suggesting that Plyler versus Doe was incorrectly decided. And uh, that is a decision that has been on the book for you know, many decades now, and there would not, I believe, have been much of an appetite for taking another run at that case um, while Kennedy was on the court. But now that Justice Kennedy has been replaced by Justice Kavanaugh, I believe that there could well be five justices to reverse the Plyler versus Doe decision. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You are um, concerned with other kinds of potential restrictions on the rights of students. I know one is the, the current uh, uh, controversy about um, the whether students can use the bathroom of their mm -hmm. the gender that mm -hmm. that they identify as. Mm -hmm. You want to say something about your position on that and where sure. and how you see the landscape on that? Issue? Sure. Yeah, that's a really important issue. Uh, trans students uh, using restrooms, and the Supreme Court of the United States granted certiorari, meaning they agreed to hear 
a dispute about this issue, but ultimately dis declined to do so because there was a change in the guidance uh, pro provided by the Trump administration. The Obama administration offered guidance that was meant to make sure that students had access to the restrooms that are congruent with their gender identities. The Trump administration rescinded that guidance. These days, these issues are often decided under the Equal Protection Clause. And, you know, Justice Kennedy was the most vocal proponent of gay equality in the history of the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. And many people, of course, would understand some similarity between these issues of gay equality and trans students. We don't know what, uh, you know, Justice Kavanaugh thinks about this issue, but there is a reason to believe that his issues will be to the right of where Justice Kennedy was. And this is one instance where we could well see a different outcome as a result of uh, Justice Kavanaugh replacing Justice Kennedy. And one of the, the other topics you talk about in the book is the kind of um, how, how if a case had come two years earlier, it could have gone a completely different way. Certain kinds of decisions that we think are st established law, if it if one little thing had been different, that might. So That's say exactly I, right. Uh, it's important to understand that constitutional law is incredibly contingent. That is to say that exactly as you suggest, when a case arises who the personnel are on the court can make a tremendous difference. Let me give you an example. It's a case called San Antonio Independent School District versus Rodriguez, which dealt with a challenge to the way that schools are funded. That happens overwhelmingly by property tax, which means that students in poor neighborhoods often receive a lot less money per pupil than students in wealthy neighborhoods. When this constitutional was when this constitutional uh, when this decision was challenged under the Constitution. Uh, the, uh, many people thought in 1968 that it was guaranteed that the Warren Court was going to uh, be receptive to that challenge. The Warren Court is understood to be an egalitarian institution. And people, some of whom disliked the prospect of a loss in this area, said, um, you know, this is going to be, uh, there's going to be a transformation here. By the time it makes its way up to the court in 1973, President Nixon has four Supreme Court appointees, and all four of them join with Potter Stewart to reject the challenge. Uh, and it's worth saying as well that even had the lawsuit come a few years later, that it's possible that one of Nixon's appointees, say Justice Blackman, would have joined with the liberals in order to have a 5-4 outcome going in the opposite direction and everything. So the idea that these constitutional decisions are somehow foreordained or you know controlled by the drafters of this legislation is very difficult to square with reality. Another, uh, there's so many fascinating things in the book, but another thing I, I mean, you, you were, you, you clerked for O'Connor and for Breyer. And you tell a story about Breyer writing a dissenting opinion and that, that just had a huge impact on you. So tell us that story. Really yeah, I was very lucky to work for two different Supreme Court justices and both of them in their own way shaped this project. Justice O'Connor was beginning to think about working on civics education. She was incredibly distressed about mm -hmm. the sorry state of understanding that many young people have about our constitutional order. Lots of people know Judge Judy, very few know Chief Justice Roberts, right? And many people can't name the three branches of government. And so my work with this project is designed to meet students where they are. My mm -hmm. hope is that if people think about constitutional rights in a way that affect their everyday reality of being students, that this will in effect serve as a gateway to thinking about these larger structural con constitutional questions. Justice Breyer um, wrote uh, a couple of very important opinions that I write about in this book, one of which was a case uh, 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 called Parents Involved in Community Schools. This was uh, a case that arose out of both Louisville and Seattle where schools wanted to have voluntary integration programs. They said if we assign students to school only to the neighborhood schools, then as a result of the persistence of residential segregation, uh, we're gonna have racially isolated schools. And so in order to combat that, we're gonna have uh, racial classifications that are designed to bring people together. Chief Justice Roberts wrote an opinion where he said, in effect, this is a battle for Brown versus Board of Education. Brown versus Bo Bo Board of Education invalidated school districts telling students where they could go to school based on the color of their skin. 
these modern programs in Louisville and Seattle tell students where they can go to school based on the color of their skin. Therefore, they have to be invalidated. He said it doesn't matter that in the bad old days, people were designed to keep apart and keep black people subordinated, and that today people are designing these programs to bring people together. My old boss, uh, Justice Breyer, wrote a very long, and in my unbiased opinion, completely <laughs> devastating dissenting opinion where he said that to compare Topeka, Kansas of the 1950s to Louisville and Seattle of today is a cruel distortion of history and a warped understanding of Brown versus Board of Education. He read his dissent from the beach, from the bench, pardon me, definitely not from the beach. Uh, he read his dissent from the bench for more than 20 minutes, signaling his profound disagreement with the court in this area. And the seriousness with which he went about that project were an inspiration, it was an inspiration to me thinking about the importance of constitutional law in the nation's public schools. Yeah, that point you make about when they dissent from the bench, especially when these dissents are very lengthy, and the kind of significance of that particular act on the part of a justice, uh, to suggest the kind of pressures or the kind of intensity of the issue, uh, that's really fascinating. There's so many fascinating things in this book. Um, let me ask you this. What, what, um, what was the most surprising thing you learned when you were researching this yeah, book? Yeah, the most surprising thing that I learned is that corporal punishment persists in this great nation of ours. The Supreme Court had an opportunity to rein in this practice in the 1970s that arose from truly egregious facts where a student in Miami, Florida was hit 20 times with a two foot long wooden paddle and he missed more than uh, two weeks of school and it was another three weeks before he could sit down without experiencing discomfort. He had even three days after this incident, a bruise that was six inches in diameter and that was tender, purplish, swollen, oozing fluid even. I mean, just a grisly set of facts and you would think that this would rise to an Eighth Amendment violation, that is to say, it violates the prohibition on cruel and unusual punishment. But in a shocking opinion, Justice Powell, again, in a five to four decision, uh, said that this beating doesn't qualify as punishment for purposes of the Eighth Amendment because it's not punishment that flows from a criminal conviction. So that decision struck me as deeply wrong-headed, and what surprised me most is that it exists in this great nation. That is to say that there are 18 states that still permit corporal punishment. In some ways that overstates its prevalence, though, because just five states account for more than 70 percent of the instances of corporal punishment, mm -hmm. and those five states are in the South, and it will come as no surprise to many viewers that uh, students of color receive a disproportionate share of corporal punishment. And so if I have any single hope for my book, it's that it elevates the salience of this issue and invites the Supreme Court uh, to revisit that wrong-headed decision from four decades ago uh, because it's my fear that if the Supreme Court doesn't get involved, then the jurisdictions that retain the practice at this late date are not going to abandon it of their own volition. Mm -hmm. I know you're also, you speak of the uh, t recent tendency for police officers to now be in, cl in schools. Say your, give us a sense of your view on that. Tom. Yeah, I write about that in a section called The Rise and Rise of School Resource Officers. Um, that is, in my view, an Orwellian term, if ever there were one, since that these are uniformed police officers that are patrolling schools. In the 1980s, when the Supreme Court started thinking about criminal procedure, having uniformed police officers in schools was a rare thing. These days, at least in certain schools, it's quite commonplace, and there are schools of often uh, uh, students coming from marginalized communities. And what I find to be distressing is that um, having police officers present has a tendency to transform a schoolyard dispute uh, and turns it into a police matter. And so people use this term school to prison pipeline to describe what happens there. Mm -hmm. And um, I, some of your viewers will recall an event out of South Carolina that happened a few years back where a teenager was supposedly disrupting class and a uniformed police officer came and turned her chair over and threw her out of the chair and she was subsequently arrested under something called a disturbing school statute. And in South Carolina, um, it talked about uh, to disturb schools meant to behave in an obnoxious manner. And uh, when you start thinking about 
uh, what teenager could plead innocent to mm. behaving in an obnoxious manner in schools. Uh, it raises some of the uh, concerns about the ubiquity of the way that these statutes, which are quite vague, are used to uh, introduce people to the criminal justice system at a very young age. And, you, I mean, the one of the arguments that you make is that, it's not just your argument, but that it doesn't make sense for schools to not be places where uh, young Americans learn about um, the way the Constitution works for everybody. Mm -hmm. That that it, it, that if the law the rules that apply to students aren't the same rules that apply to everybody else, that's going to teach our children something fundamentally incorrect about our country. That's exactly right, and this is something that Jackson, Justice Jackson, pressed in the Barnett decision, um, where he said, uh, "I understand that there are fears." that judges are not teachers and they don't have any expertise in this area. And that's true enough. Nevertheless, Jackson insisted that judges have a responsibility to vindicate constitutional rights when they are infringed. And when the public school is regulating students, they are operating on behalf of the government. Jackson said that uh, if we don't monitor this area in the face of uh, infringements on constitutional rights, then we risk teaching students to discount constitutional principles as mere platitudes. And he goes further and he says, we risk strangling the free mind at its source. That's an incredibly evocative language. Uh, the Supreme Court, in my view, did a, a solid job of protecting students' constitutional rights for a period, but in more recent decades, it has failed in that responsibility. So we just have a couple of minutes left. Um, what are you working on now? You've done this project, or is the new work related? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, <laughs> if you can the tell truth me. of the matter is <laughs> I'm not totally uh, prepared to talk about it. Uh, I am hard at work on another book, and it's related to this project, but I'll have to leave it for another day to say precisely how it's related. Um, yeah, I'll leave it there. Okay, so let me ask you another question. Okay. Um, there's talk about a, a enlarging the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. What do you think about that? Mm -hmm. So I'll say uh, this, that uh, there was a court packing plan in the 1930s that proved incredibly controversial. These things have come to the fore. Certainly people who favor these sorts of proposals don't refer to them as court packing plans. Um, I share uh, the frustration that many uh, Democrats feel as a result of my old boss, Judge Garland, uh, not even getting a hearing in order to become uh, Justice Garland. Um, so I absolutely understand the deep sense of frustration. Some liberal law professors have suggested that it's unwise in order to uh, pursue these sorts of plans and they contend that it will undermine faith in the rule of law. So um, I've identified the issues for you. And, uh, <laughs> okay. You know, I'm gonna avoid uh, weighing in on that matter. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us today. It's been a real pleasure. Okay, thank you, I really enjoyed it. I've been speaking with Justin Driver, the Harry N. Wyatt Professor of Law at the University of Chicago Law School. His first book, The Schoolhouse Gate, Public Education, The Supreme Court and the Battle for the American Mind was published in September 2018. Driver gave a lecture titled, Are Public Schools Becoming Constant Constitution-Free Zones on April 8th, 2019, as part of this year's African-American Workshop and Lecture Series. Thanks so much for watching. <laughs>